Let's turn in God's word to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy 1. We're going to read words here which have been quoted and preached on at the installation services many, many times in the history of the church. Deuteronomy 1, verses 1 through 18. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea, between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dizahab. There are eleven days' journey from Horeb, by the way of Mount Seir, unto Kadesh Barnea. And it came to pass in the fortieth year, since the exodus from Egypt, in the eleventh month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spake unto the children of Israel according unto all that the Lord had given him in commandment unto them. After he had slain Sihon, the king of the Amorites, which dwelt in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, which dwelt at Astaroth in Edrai, on this side Jordan, in the land of Moab, to the east of that river, therefore, began Moses to declare this law, saying, The Lord our God spake unto us in Horeb, saying, Ye have dwelt long enough in this mount. Take, turn you and take your journey and go to the mount of the Amorites and unto all the places nigh unto, in the plain, in the hills and in the vale and in the south and by the seaside to the land of the Canaanites and unto Lebanon, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give it unto them and to their seed after them. And I spake unto you at that time, saying, I am not able to bear you myself alone. The Lord your God hath multiplied you, and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are, and bless you as he hath promised you. How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? Take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. And he answered me and said, The thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. And I took the chief of your tribes, wise men and known, and made them heads over you, captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, and captains over fifties, and captains over tens, and officers among your tribes. And I charged your judges at that time, saying, Hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother, and the stranger that is with him. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great, Ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me, and I will hear it. And I command you, I commanded you at that time all the things which ye should do. Amen. Beloved congregation, Almighty God has just reinstalled two office bearers in our midst. As Elder Ivan Reed and as Deacon Julian Kennedy. Our text, Deuteronomy 1, 
verses 9 through 15, which we read earlier, speaks of the installation not of two, but of many office bearers in Israel. Moses spoke and penned these words over 3,400 years ago on the far side of the river Jordan in the plains of Moab. He was referring to the appointment itself, which took place 40 years before near Mount Sinai, just before they reached that holy hill. And there is an awful lot here, beloved, that's instructive and challenging for us. Too much for one sermon. So it's become two sermons. That's happened before here. And the challenging part is going to be this morning, but especially this evening, which will deal with the charge that Moses gives to the rulers in verses 16 through 18. And so as I said earlier, it is no wonder that our text has been used many times in God's Catholic or universal church in the installation of office bearers. We stand in that tradition over many centuries. As we look this morning at rulers in God's Israel. I said that deliberately because rulers in God's Israel in the first instance and in Deuteronomy 1, that's ancient Israel. Three and a half millennia ago almost. And we, each and every true congregation included, are God's Israel today. There's the connection. Rulers in God's Israel. First, the various offices. And second, the key elements. The various offices for rulers in God's Israel. And the key elements in rulers in God's Israel. As you all know, there were three main offices in Old Testament Israel. These three nouns are associated in your mind more so perhaps than any other three nouns. Prophets, priests, and kings. Good to get that fixed in our hearts. And under these three central offices, prophets, priests, and kings, all, or at the very least, almost all, of the other offices that are mentioned in the Old Testament scriptures can be subsumed. Think of the prophet. Under that, we think of the sons of the prophets who were led by figures like Samuel and later Elijah and Elisha. We could also include here prophetic amanuenses or pen men who wrote down what the prophets declared, like Barak, who assisted Jeremiah, the office of prophet. Then there's the office of priest. You have at the top the high priest, then the chief priests, then the, parentheses, ordinary priests, and then serving the priests, and in that general field, the Levites. And moving to the third office, that of king, the kings were preceded by, and so the kings superseded, The judges, all the way from the first judge, Othniel, right through the book of Judges, to Eli and Samuel in 1 Samuel. The judges were sort of lesser kings who didn't govern ordinarily, at the very least, all of the 12 tribes. Then if you think of the king, under the king were princes and there were heads of the 12 tribes. And there were judges. And the Old Testament speaks of elders. And the word ruler is used. And all of those words speak of people who served in kingly positions. Or exercised aspects of the kingly office at a lower grade. 
so to speak. Now the offices that are spoken of in our text, five different words in our English translation are used. And if you want to look down at Deuteronomy 1, you'll see near the end of verse 13, rulers or heads. And then in verse 15, we read about heads. That same verse talks about captains. Captains over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. At the end of verse 15, we read of officers among your tribes. And verse 16 begins, I charged your judges, rulers, heads, captains, over various numbers, officers and judges. Five <coughs> English words used. And these are the same offices spoken of in Exodus 18, the chapter and its events to which Moses is referring in Deuteronomy 1. Exodus 18 in verses 21 and 25 talks about rulers, rulers over thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens. And you'll remember those numbers. The rulers over these numbers are the same things as the captains over the same numbers, thousands, hundreds, fifties, tens. Verse 25 talks about heads and these rulers or heads judge says Exodus 18, 22 and 26. And if someone judges, they are therefore judges. Rulers, heads, judges in Exodus 18 are the same offices mentioned in Deuteronomy 1. Of course they are because Moses in Deuteronomy 1 is referring back to the events recorded in Exodus 18. Now my point is here, that all of these offices mentioned in both Exodus and Deuteronomy, all of these offices are in the same field. We're not speaking, with respect to any of these offices, of the prophetic office. The prophetic office is all about receiving a word directly from God and then communicating it to the people. Not here. We're not talking here about priestly work either because priests offer sacrifices and pray on the basis of the sacrifices at an altar in a holy place, especially the tabernacle or later on the temple. You get the point. Not prophets, not priests, but we're dealing with the kingly office because kings rule and these chapters... Exodus 18, Deuteronomy 1, talk about ruling. And kings judge. Though we may not think of it this way, judging is a key component in ruling. Parents rule over their children. It's not the usual verb we use, and there's more compassion than perhaps the word rule would ordinarily imply. But the ruling over your children involves judging. You have to step in and you have to talk to them about right and wrong and who's in the right and who's in the wrong and how you put things to rights again. Authority in ruling involves judging. And if you think a moment about it, you'll easily understand that the king is the highest judge who judges upon a throne, a throne of Judgment. And that was the point with Solomon, that wise king who judged between the two harlots and the, with regard to the two little babies, one that died in the middle of the night in 1 Kings 3. No one else could deal with it. It comes up to Solomon and he passes judgment. David passes judgment too, for instance, in 2 Samuel 14. Now I'm getting to this point. The church office that is equivalent, the New Testament church office that's equivalent to those mentioned in Deuteronomy 1, and therefore Exodus 18, 
is the office of elder. Elders rule the church, though not with an iron fist. They rule the church. And that's the word used in the form which we read. They rule the church under Jesus Christ and in his name and according to the word. So they rule the church sort of looking up and realize we're being ruled by one who's over us. And he tells us the word to rule according to his word. And many of the procedures are even outlined in the church order. So it's to be done in the justice and mercy of God. Elders rule the church and elders judge. They don't go around judging in the bad sense that's forbidden in Matthew 7. But they judge righteous judgment which sometimes escalates to the point of church discipline and which on a lower and ordinarily friendlier level involves admonition and encouragement where that's necessary. So Deuteronomy 1 speaks especially to the office of elder. But this word also applies to deacons in a smaller church like ours. I want to quote to you the relevant part of Church Order 37. Whenever the number of the elders is small, the deacons may be added to the consistory by local regulation. So a particular church, there aren't that many elders. The elders and the minister may vote to decide to bring the deacons in. Then it goes on to say, this shall invariably be the rule where the number of elders is less than three. And in our church we have two elders. So the deacons are, as the church order directs, added to the consistory and thereby the technical word is becoming therefore the council. So uh, the deacons have a say in the ruling and judging work of elders. So this word then that we're looking at in Deuteronomy 1, both now and even later this evening, applies first of all and most obviously to elders, as Mr. Reed, Mr. Crossett, and to the deacons here, including the one reinstalled, and thereby we don't say, oh, the service was about four men in the church, nothing to do with me. I could just catch up and sleep and have it a busy week. We say, thirdly, this does involve me because I need to know what's the work of an elder and the implication of deacon because they're over me in the Lord and I need to be able to pray for them and understand their work and give myself to their inspection and so forth as the form says, so that we're all in this together, working together, so that the whole thing works. Or to give a really clear, obvious situation, if we install an office bearer and the office bearer isn't equipped, lives an ungodly, foolish life, and disregards the word, he is going to bring the church, and it may well affect me and my family, into a mess so that we're all going to be chastised by the Lord. I'm involved in this. And of course, God may well call some who aren't in office in the near or medium or distant future to be office bearers in the church too. And now having made that basic foundational point, I want to demonstrate to you that Deuteronomy 1, and now especially 9 through 15, our focus in this sermon, treats the key elements in office bearers. They're all there. This passage explains, for instance, the need for office bearers, and to use the word that's mentioned here, rulers. The need for rulers. You'll have picked that up when we went through Deuteronomy 1, the need for rulers is explained in this passage in that, to put it in concise words, Moses can't do it all alone. That's Exodus 18, as well as Deuteronomy 1. 
Moses, in verses 10 and 11, says to the Lord, there are too many people here. And then he makes the point, it's not that I, I, I want them to be fewer. May the Lord multiply you a thousand times more than what you are and bless you. But there's too many people for me to rule over alone. There were 603,550 men who were fit to go out to war and then add to that the same number of women and probably more. And then children, so we're talking two to three million, possibly more. And then these two to three million people living together in an encampment in tents. You can imagine how many rows that would cause. That's more people than the whole of Northern Ireland. How many courts are there? How many cases of people falling out and suing each other? Well, Moses says there's too many people and there are too many cases for me to deal with. And Exodus 14 says Moses got up in the morning and he's dealing with cases and he's dealing with them all day and he only switches off at night. And so with so many people and so many cases, the whole thing is too much of a burden to Moses. And it took his father-in-law, Jethro, to come along and say to Moses, Exodus 18, you're going to wear yourself out. You won't be able to stick this workload. That'll be terrible for you. And bad for the people of God. And so Jethro in Exodus 18 says to Moses, You need helpers, other rulers. And the perspective of Deuteronomy 1 is that Moses himself takes this advice of the board and he realizes, I need people to help me and assist me in this work. And so he, believing this in himself and having heard it from Jethro, then tells the people, we need more men to help out here. And we have something very similar to this in the New Testament scriptures. I'm referring to Acts chapter 6. The form even mentioned this too. The number of Christians was multiplied. The church in Jerusalem gets bigger and bigger. 3,000 is mentioned. 5,000 more are added. And the 12 apostles can't get round everybody and keep everybody's name straight, especially when people are brought in from the outside. Some Grecians, they may not even know them, or at least not know much about them or know them well. They can't administer the daily food distribution to the widows and the needy. And so they propose the creation of the office of deacon. Too much work. Therefore, more office bearers needed. In Deuteronomy 1, rulers and elders, and in Acts 6, deacons. Now, there are various reasons for the need for office bearers and rulers. We've mentioned the one that too much work to do, so other helpers are needed. The form for the ordination of elders and deacons gives an additional reason there are others an additional reason why elders are needed not only because there would be too much for the minister to do alone but let me quote now from page 291 moreover it is proper that such men elders should be joined to the ministers of the word in the government of the church that thereby all tyranny and lording may be kept out of the church of God, which, that is tyranny and lording, may sooner creep in when the government is placed in the hands of one alone or of a very few. Then it goes on to say that the ministers plus the elders form a body or assembly which acts together as a council for the church. So the passage deals with the need for rulers because God doesn't give this office in Deuteronomy 1 or the office of elder today or for that matter the office of deacon as some sort of a window dressing. It is needed and the people in the church ought to understand and even feel that need. We as a church need elders. I need elders. My family needs elders. God provides it with this office and with men to fill the office. 
Moving from the need to rulers, we observe too that Deuteronomy 1 deals with the qualifications for rulers. Verse 13 says that these men must be, quote, known among your tribes. And this teaches us that the elders or rulers not only need to know the church, when they're in the church and have been in the church for some time, but God's people need to know them, at least to some degree. You need to know them. You need to know who they are. You need to know that they are in office. You need to know certain things about them before you can vote for or even against them. And this idea that the qualification for a ruler requires that the person be known includes a man spending time in a congregation before he is eligible for nomination or to become an office bearer. And there are some churches which have local rules on paper that stipulate that before anyone can be put on a slate for an elder or a deacon, he has to be a member of that particular congregation for a certain time, a year or two years or three years or whatever it is. No matter how well qualified, to take that example, the person is, they actually need to be here so that the people know him or the vast majority know him. He's been with us, mixing with us in the congregation, partaking of the life of the church. That's one qualification mentioned in Deuteronomy 1. He needs to be known. And then verses 13 and 15 speak of wisdom and understanding. Wisdom, a man of wisdom and a man of understanding. So much could be said here. Wisdom refers to the ability to adapt to reality. Simple definition. Wisdom is adapting to reality. And that's why evolutionism is really foolish. It's not adapting to reality. It's living in an imaginary world. Wisdom, as adapting to reality, adapts, first of all, to the fundamental, most basic reality, God. Wisdom reckons with God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wisdom reckons with the reality that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who has come into the world to save sinners by his death on the cross. It's wisdom for everybody, and you certainly need an elder who's conscious God rules. Jesus Christ is Lord. And the Word, the Bible, is God's truth. I could say an awful lot more, but there's the basics for it. There's wisdom, there's adopting to reality in your life and now especially in the church. There's a God. This is Christ's church redeemed by his blood and the word must rule. Wisdom and understanding. When I'm in the church, I'm not dealing with a group of people who of certain similarities, dissimilarities, and some of whom are more likable than others. And some of them could take or leave. That's not it. Understanding is the church consists of Christ's blood-bought people, beloved of him. That all believers are sheep and therefore sinful and weak according to the flesh with a small beginning of a new obedience, but that they are, for all that, new creations in Jesus Christ, heirs of the gift of eternal life, wisdom and understanding. And therefore, justice and mercy need to be the way of government in the congregation of the Lord. Wisdom and understanding ordinarily come with age. Now they come by the Holy Spirit. I, I know that. They come by feeding upon the Word. They come by all sorts of 
listenings to other people and so forth, but wisdom and understanding ordinarily, one could say the ordinarily come with age. And that's why the office is called the office of an elder, because ordinarily they're older people. And wisdom and understanding come with age because, as the saying is, people live and learn. They live and learn, Christians do, and they live and learn in the church. And if wisdom and understanding come with age, another way of saying that is that wisdom and understanding come with experience. You could say basically there are are two types of people. There are some people that no matter what experiences they go through, you end up shaking your head and saying, there's a man, he never learns. He never learns. He's making the same mistake all over again. You'd have thought he'd learned last time, but he's doing it again and again and again. That's the definition of a fool. But a wise man learns by, over time and through experience. And the learning, which is by age and by experience, when you get wisdom and understanding, I'm thinking now of our elder, our elder here, the one reinstalled today, has been through three major church splits as an office bearer. There are probably a few people in Northern Ireland that have had that. An office bearer, three major splits, where half or more than half the people ended up leaving. And what's even more unusual is that by the grace of God, he was on the right side as an office bearer in three church divisions, each and every occasion. And for somebody to do that, as an office bearer in three cases, you need some spiritual wisdom. And somebody who does that grows in understanding through such difficult experiences. Let me give you a couple of scriptures. One in the Old Testament. And from Jethro in Exodus 18, advising Moses. Thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such as rulers. Or important words of Paul, which apply to all Christians, and which therefore in a special sense would apply to office bearers, 1 Corinthians 15, the last verse in that great chapter on the resurrection. Be ye therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So that the Christian, and now here office bearer especially, needs to be steadfast in the grace of God. That's the way the person is in their heart, by faith, in their inner conviction. The person is steadfast. And then it says unmovable. And if a person is steadfast in himself, he cannot be moved. Unmovable means that forces come upon that person. Some people in the congregation, some people outside the congregation. Things in their life. But the person is steadfast. And though all these forces and sometimes the intentions of other people are such that they would want them to move they don't move because they're steadfast therefore they are unmovable and if that's the person they're steadfast and they can't be moved from the truth as it is in Jesus taught in the scriptures summed in our confessions taught in the church then that person is going to be always abounding in the work of the Lord because that's what the person is steadfast and unmovable And therefore what the person does, he always abounds in the work of the Lord. Always abounds in it because they're steadfast and unmovable. Because of who they are, that determines what they do. Not a reed shaken in the wind. The person must be known Wise understanding, which points at age and experience. And if you want to look 
on your own at the passages which especially deal with qualifications for rulers or leaders in God's Israel. We've mentioned the two in the Old Testament. There are others that bring out different points. But we have Exodus 18 and Deuteronomy 1. And in the two in the New Testament that especially stand out are 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. The need for rulers, the qualification of rulers, Deuteronomy 1. And thirdly, we have the election of rulers. The election of rulers by the people of God. Look with me closely at verse 13 because you may have missed this when we first read it. That verse says, Moses addressing Israel, Take you, wise men, and understanding, and known among your tribes. You, the people of Israel, are to take people with these qualifications. Now when it says take them, it means choose them, set them apart, elect them. You are to take them. And so here in Deuteronomy 1, we read of the election of office bearers, rulers, even in the Old Testament, not just in the New Testament. And we read of them here from the earliest days of the nation of Israel, because I've said before, time and time again, Deuteronomy 1 is referring to Exodus 18. And Israel leaves Egypt in Exodus 12 or 13. So we're dealing with days and at the most weeks after the redemption from Egypt with them as a nation and even at that early stage the people are voting for their office bearers and rulers and in the New Testament the clearest instance of the vote of the members of people for office bearers in the church is in connection with the office of deacon in Acts 16 to, to which we have already referred. I'm going now though to quote a couple of relevant verses. The apostles say this to the, Jew, to the church in Jerusalem. Wherefore brethren, look ye out among you. Take seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. These are the qualifications. Elect such men. Verse 5 says, the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose, and then it gives the names of the first seven deacons. And it's interesting too that the method of a congregational vote, the people choosing, it pleased them in Acts 6. Deuteronomy 1 verse 14, you answered me, says Moses, and said, the thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do, that is, in the Old and New Testament, the people said, that's an eminently worthy, sensible, good way to do it. We'll have a vote with regard to the qualifications for rulers, the ones who are going to rule over us. And this truth of the election of office bearers, pastors, elders, and deacons in the New Testament church, is a crucial element of church government. This brings us back to the Church of Rome and the issue at the Reformation. Well, here was one aspect of it. Rome, and it's the same today, the hierarchy, the hierarchy appoint the office bearers. Not the people. Why? The inner reason for this is not only, well, Rome doesn't give a hoot what Scripture says, but the inner reason for it is the church is apostate. The members don't have the Holy Spirit. Nor do the office bearers that matter. So there's no recognition of the believers and appointing of their own office bearers. And there's no recognition by the member by the office bearers that they're called of God through the church. Because the spirit is the word aren't there. It's a corrupt apostate institution. But with the recovery of the gospel of grace, and you can say with the recovery of the church, that is with believers in the pew at the Reformation, it recovered the church offices. Pastor, elder, deacon. Qualifications. The men need to be qualified. They need to be chosen. There's an election and there's the office of believer, a key reformed truth. Each person individually being a prophet, priest and king with the Holy Spirit and Christ in them who chooses 
chooses those who rule and govern in the church of Jesus Christ. And here in our congregation, the church order spells out, so that everyone can see it clearly, the steps which are agreed upon in our midst. And it's taken place recently here. And things are done decently and in order. The need for rulers. We need them. The qualification of rulers. Here they are. The election of rulers. And the fourth and final thing in this connection. The installation of rulers. Which follows upon their election. To quote more fully verse 13 of Deuteronomy 1. Take you. There's the election. Wise men understanding and known among your tribes. There's their qualifications. You take them. You choose them. You appoint them. And I will make them rulers over you. The people says it's a good thing. And that's what they did. Verse 15 says, So I took the chief of your tribes, these wise men and known, and made them heads over you. That is, Moses ordained, appointed, and installed these men to their office. And if you think about it, Moses, the greatest ruler and glorious type of Christ in the Old Testament, Moses not only wrote the first five books of the Bible and Psalm 90, but Moses installed an awful lot of office bearers in his lifetime. He installed these rulers in Exodus 18, as we've seen just before they got to Sinai. And then at Sinai, in Leviticus 8, he installed Aaron as the first high priest and at the same time installed his four sons as the first four priests, Nadab and Abihu, who were apostates and though they were lawfully installed, God struck them down with fire. And then Eleazar and Ithamar, also in their time at Mount Sinai, Moses installed the Levites in Numbers 8, not long before they left Mount Sinai. Moses presented the Levites before God. Here they are. And interestingly, the people put their hands on the Levites, not so much now they're being installed into office, but symbolizing a transfer of the responsibility of the people with their firstborn sons who ought to have died. We're transferring that over to these Levites who, to serve the Lord. And then when they got to Kibroth Hata'ava in Numbers 11, Moses was involved in the appointment of 70 leaders, including Eldad and Medad. Moses gathered them together and God came and took the spirit that was upon Moses and gave some of it to those 70 men. And then fifthly, Eleazar was designated the high priest at Mount Hor in Numbers 20 when Moses took the holy priestly garments off Aaron who was just about to die and put them on Eleazar and later presumably Eleazar would have been anointed high priest with the holy anointing oil at the tabernacle. And appropriately the sixth and last ordination performed by Moses was that of his own successor, Joshua, in Numbers 27, when Moses laid on him both hands. You will now lead Israel. Be strong and very courageous. So you don't turn aside to the right hand or to the left hand, but follow the Lord by obeying his word. And now our two brothers here were installed and reinstalled in their respective offices. And this means that God himself has called them. And this is their confession in the very first question that was asked of them earlier. I quote, In the first place I ask you, both elders and deacons, whether you do not feel in your hearts that ye are lawfully called of God's church and consequently of God himself. To these, your respective holy offices. And that's what we in the church must see. Not merely, well, there's Mr. X and there's Mr. Y. And they're, they're elders in our church. But we must see that they're men who are called by Jesus Christ. And that they are clothed in their office, given authority by God. 
And that's faith in the word that adds something. Not just here's a person, this is what they do, but God has given them authority for this specific task. And if you don't see that and you don't approach them that way, you won't benefit from the office of elder and you'll probably do yourself a lot of spiritual harm. We've been talking about office bearers. I want in closing to speak about our Lord Jesus Christ as the great office bearer of the church. Not just one congregation, but the whole church in space and time. The only sinless office bearer of the church. Unlike every last one of the other ones. The only office bearer in the church who is both God and man. Because you know what the rest of them are. Yep, they're just men. And there's not one of them's a woman. And he is the only office bearer who is the absolutely supreme Lord of the church. That's an office bearer. And we've gone through the stages, spelled them out. There are four mentioned in the church order and found in Deuteronomy 1 throughout Scripture. Think of the election of the supreme office bearer. A choice by Almighty God before the foundation of the world. And not a single human being had a single vote. Think of the need for such an office bearer. God's greatest prophet, priest and king. Our sin and misery. The curse of the law and the dominion of Satan, death and hell. We need that office bearer. And there he was, qualified for his office. Being given the Holy Spirit without measure. And guess what? The office bearers that you've seen in this church too have the Holy Spirit, but it's most definitely measured. It's most definitely not without measure. Qualified by his own perfect obedience, unlike all the other office bearers, with a perfect holy love for Almighty God. He was installed into office as the one who was sent into the world in his incarnation. As the one who was called to the public exercise of his office by his baptism at the hands of John the Baptist by the River Jordan. And he was installed by being enthroned at the right hand of God after his atoning death, mighty resurrection and ascension up into glory. And here is the wonder that the glorious Son of God reigning in heaven and coming back soon calls men to serve in the special offices of his church and that he actually uses them. Uses them with their sins and weaknesses but uses them to build up his body to the honor of his own holy name. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, bless us in this church. Bless and equip and prosper our office bearers. Help us to work together in a way that pleases and honors thee and that glorifies thy great name. Equip us all by the Spirit that we may function in our rules. Not be discontent, not Lord, but serve. And forgive all of our many sins in this regard too, as in all areas of our lives, for thy great mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.